The subject this morning seems to me to have a great deal of special significance for those who are seeking a reunion or a revival of the integrities of learning in their own lives. We're not thinking primarily now of the great world outside, but of the impact of outside pressures upon ourselves. In the modern world, we have two highly conflicting structures of learning. The first and oldest is religion. The second and youngest is science. And these two, for some unknown reason, seem to be in constant conflict. The average scientist lives in a world that is nominally religious. The average religious person lives in a world that is nominally administered by science. And we have two very definite problems. Science deals with things visible. Therefore, the goal of science is facts. Religion deals with things invisible. And the goal of religion is truth. Is there really a conflict between truth and fact? Well, in ancient times, there was an arbitrator between these two extremes. And that arbitrator was philosophy. Philosophy was very largely a means of reconciling the visible and the invisible aspects of life. Science recognized and respected philosophy because it demonstrated a very clear intellectual and rational approach to all types of phenomena. Religion also respected philosophy and built a great part of it into its own structure. For it recognized that philosophy was also building a reasonable foundation under things unseen and invisible. Gradually, philosophy has lost the name of action. Generation after generation, science has flourished, religion has survived, and philosophy has limped along as a kind of intellectual cripple. Why this should happen is sometimes difficult to understand, for, but for one point, namely, that in our modern life, we draw to various fields of learning those who find in these fields opportunities for personal orientation, a measure of success, a measure of recognition, and a measure of reward. At this time, philosophy is not fashionable. It does not meet the general approval of the people. Science is venerated by the young, religion is sustaining the elder, and in between is nothing but industrialism. The uh, philosophy that should guide us in the journey of life has lost its grip upon the popular imagination. Perhaps one of the reasons for this is that the modern philosopher, scholastically speaking, is indoctrinated in a system of education which is essentially materialistic. Therefore, what used to be the particular field and claim of philosophy has gradually drifted into a more restricted area called psychology. Several efforts have been made to combine philosophy and psychology, and some of these have had a fair measure of success. But with a few marked exceptions, psychology itself is under the domination of science. 
and its techniques and procedures are largely scientific. Actually, there is no ground for reason for believing that religion and science are incompatible. We simply have to consider two areas in which these specializations function. The visible, tangible, physical universe is the province of science. Very few persons today have escaped from the hypnosis of materiality. To see something, to touch it, to hear it, to understand it from a scientific standpoint results in what the average individual considers to be fact. We are made to assume that physical things are factual. Metaphysical things are theoretical. And to the factualist, little better than superstitions. So in the search for the factual, we have locked ourselves within a complex which is almost unendurable. Facts are dead things for the most part. About all they can possibly contribute to our well-being is a greater measure of physical security or luxury or wealth. Actually, for most people, this is all they want. The average individual is not primarily concerned with the problems of his immortal soul. He is much more concerned with taxes and inflation. He lives in a world to which he has become at least partly adjusted. And in this world, physical things are all important. And any request or advice which would lure him away from the physical aspects of his existence is viewed with suspicion. What are we actually gaining, however, from all of this? We are locking ourselves in a three-dimensional world. We are locking ourselves in a world of effects. And we are denying even the existence of a world of causes. We are bound to a situation which worsens every day and is to a very large degree dominated by the scientific implementation of physical ambitions. By science we have received the telephone, the automobile, the radio, and the television. And these, though great in themselves as scientific discoveries, have become the greatest nuisances in history. Whatever we try to do with these things is mediocre in the extreme. The telephone has become the vehicle of small talk for most cases. It has not fulfilled itself as an instrument for the communication of basic knowledge. The condition of radio and television is worse. And practically every advancement we have made in science has been frustrated because the uses made of it have been mediocre in the extreme. We have gained very little of actual progress from these conveniences. Science should be in a very definite position to estimate life in a far more comprehensive way than is its present policy. Science can reveal to us and does reveal to us a universe of exactitudes, a universe in which the mechanisms of existence transcend even the wildest imagination. 
we are in the midst of a mystery so magnificent and so inscrutable that the human mind is almost incapable of coping with it. Science of all branches of learning is in the best position to estimate the mystery of existence in terms of the material world in which we live. Science should and must finally accept one simple fact, that it cannot find the ultimate answer to anything. Science is working on a level bound above and below by the boundaries of matter. It cannot transcend matter, but it cannot discover in matter the causes of existence. So the scientist must deal with what has been termed secondary causes. These secondary causes are in substance effects. There is a secondary cause behind everything that exists in the material world. That secondary cause can be known because it represents not the answer to the question why, but to the question how. Secondary cause becomes to the scientific mind ultimate cause or a substitute for it beyond which the mind cannot go. Many scientists, however, are not satisfied with the present procedures. We are spending vast sums of money in the exploration of a three-dimensional area which we call the material existence. We can examine, measure, weigh, analyze everything that has a body but bodies are effects, and the cause of them remains unknown. We can judge what an individual is, in part, by what he does. But why he does what he does is unknown to us. We grope for explanations, not for the conduct of the individual, but for the fact of his existence. He is entirely apart from his conduct. He has an existence. What this existence is, why he has it, what power fashioned it in space, and if it is an existence, where does it go? What is it doing? These questions are not easily answered. And day by day, the scientists are coming against a mysterious wall that is more difficult than the wall of China. And that is the wall which marks the boundary of matter as we know it. Science can have the hypothesis that matter simply goes on and on beyond our ability to recognize its existence and that all things are material. But science cannot prove that material elements combining in any pattern for any reason can produce an Abraham Lincoln. We do not know the mystery that lies behind the form. We know what Lincoln looked like, we know his approximate height, we know the chemicals that made up his body, we know the span of years we li he lived, but these refer only to his material structure. That which is within it <coughs> remains a mystery for which science has no adequate answer. Various ways have been used to try to explain this scientific problem. I remember many years ago I attended some lectures by Dr. William uh, Wilden Carr at the University of London. 
he was a great Aristotelian. And out of his study of Aristotle, he came to the conclusion that existence is eternal, that everything goes on forever. It never had a beginning. It can never have an end. And all the various phenomena associated with existence must be regarded as eternal factors. They must be regarded as merely the constant repetition of processes by which the mingling of certain atoms and a combination of certain electrons produce in their way certain results. These combinations go on forever. There is no rhyme, rote, or reason in them. They are simply a mass of miscellaneous factors constantly in shifting relationships with each other. Well, this gets rid of one of our problems, but it seems to me it creates a worse one. It gets rid of the problem of how did it start, and also perhaps the problem of how the future is endless. But it leaves us completely in the dark as to the reason for existence. We have something that it was never fashioned, never ends, never organizes into anything meaningful but continues to motivate its own motions and combinations forever. This, is, I think, is not demonstrable today, even in scientific terms, because one thing we do observe is that these commotions of factors are forever producing orderly sequences, and that these processes seem to be regulated by universal laws which are inflexible and inevitable. So uh, Dr. Carr was a most genial and delightful old gentleman, but he did not really solve our problem very much or do much to help it. He sim simply got rid of beginning and end, and end and left what lies between without definition or meaning. Now, science is gradually waking up to some of these facts, but unfortunately it has not the instruments with which to work on them. The scientist is not trained as far as creative imagination is concerned. He is not trained to seek for that which has not been known. He will seek for what has not been found, but not for what has not been known. To meet this situation, man at the very beginning of his history recognized that there was a form of knowledge which was not limited to matter and was concerned from the beginning of itself with the eternal quest for original cause, for the nature and purpose of life. Religion has always taken it for granted that life is purpose, that it has a reason and a meaning, that it was bestowed by a reasonable power, that it is the work of a creative, intelligent principle. On this basis, religion began to develop the moral and cultural life of the individual. And for thousands of years, culture has largely been a religious factor. It is religion that has given us love of beauty. It has ornamented the shrines and temples of the world with art, sculpturing, architectural marvels. It gave the stained glass windows to the great cathedrals, and it gave the tall minarets to the mosque. Religion has always sought to reveal life as something essentially beautiful, meaningful, 
and it established canons of beauty which declares that which is truly beautiful is according to the divine plan. Now, to uh, function in this world, then, religion had to take up the search for reality. It had to depart from the three-dimensional world of matter to the polydimensional world of consciousness. It sought to explore man not as a form uh, animated by an energy, but as a being animated by an eternal life principle. The moment religion began to fashion itself, materialism was also born, because there was always the skeptic, and the skeptic has become today more or less the ruler of human thinking. The religious aspect of the matter was cultivated with a full realization that fact, as we know it materially, is simply not available. We have mostly an agreement among scientists, uh, a Chinese scientist trained in Germany or a German scientist trained in Italy will have approximately the same instruments with which uh, to approach a problem of knowledge. Uh, science on its own level has reached a fraternity, and this fraternity has been in many ways useful. But it has been a fraternity based upon the limitations placed by scientific procedure upon the extent and expansion of knowledge. Realizing that it cannot compete with the fact that it cannot produce the popular phenomenon which we call progress, religion had to try to find out if there is a way by which the human being can discover the reason for himself. Science says there's not much reason to it, and this, of course, is sometimes demonstrable. But at the same time, there is something inside of the human being that certainly is not to be ignored. How then can you do this? How can you reach into this? Between the two extremes, philosophy took its stand. Philosophy accepts, and has in many instances advanced science, and many of the greatest discoveries of science were first revealed by philosophy. On the other hand, philosophy definitely believed in the substance of things unseen. Philosophy tried to bestow upon man a reasonable account of that part of his life which science cannot rationalize. So from philosophy in its highest form came idealism, morality, and ethics. Morality and ethics are not essentially religious in the theological sense of the word. They are merely a formularization of the experience of the human being since the beginning of his existence. Morality and ethics have been demonstrated as the basis of an enduring social situation or policy. Uh, philosophy also expanded our concept of the universe. It brought into play another kind of world, the world of mind, a world which is not primarily assuming material things, but a world which lives within itself, the mind as the nourisher of itself, the mind as the seeker after eternal value. The uh, ancient rites and mysteries of religion were very largely, therefore, the result of a partnership between idealistic philosophy and theology, and both are still to be found in close association in practically all of the living religions of mankind. Having come to a realization that you cannot use a telescope to discover the human soul, Coming finally also to the full understanding of the fact 
that a scientist can invent a hydrogen bomb, but he cannot bring security to the inner life of an individual. In fact, many of his contributions contribute to insecurity. So there is a different level, but the, that both levels are valid. Today, the scientist has a tendency to look down his nose uh, at the theologian, and religiously minded people sniff rather disdainfully at the thought of science. But actually, there is no conflict because each has an essential sphere of, its, of his own, or its own. How do we find out about those things which cannot be found in a laboratory or cannot be discovered uh, by mathematical formulas or will resist all examination of their essential natures uh, as in the case of autopsy which can examine the body but in the very process of examination uh, destroys the soul. So in the uh, search for the answer to these questions there are two answers, apparently. One scientific and the other mystical. The scientific answer can be that the scientist, in his continual searching into matter, can transcend matter. Science is in a position, from its understanding of the exactitudes of procedures in nature, to come to the realization that the material things he studies are secondary causes, but that each secondary cause depends for its validity upon a primary cause. It should be extremely simple for the average scientist to realize that what he is studying is an effect, and that he cannot, by virtue of his own instrumentation and the quality of it, discover the cause of that effect. He knows that things live. He studies living things. But he cannot approach life that is not embodied. He cannot discover life without its involvement in matter. This leads to the almost inevitable question that how can any matter exist except because of life within it. Even the most materialistic scientist realizes that life and energy exist in the most minute particles of matter. But they have not been able to analyze and advance this cause because they have no way of estimating the original source of life, the original purpose of life, and the original structure of life itself apart from its manifestations. This brings us back again to the problem of religion. How is religion going to discover that which science cannot discover? How can the average person, who is scarcely to be regarded as a scientific expert, how is an average person going to discover that which science cannot find and which theology, for the most part, cannot define? It becomes a very abstract situation. And many good minds and very wise people have tried to understand this mystery. And for the most part, it has some dealt to the simple fact that man, being a living thing, has as a living thing the only instrument by means of which the nature of life can be understood. Man can understand it because he is alive. And because he is alive, he has the potential capacity of knowing what life is. This Possibility seems to imply that universal energy, what we call the living universe, 
that this living universe is an ensouled body, and that this ensouled body can be explored by that part of itself which is ensouled in man. It can find that which is itself in each of its creations. This carries with it a series of problems, and the ancients tried to solve these problems. It opposed science with faith. It assumed that a kind of believing strengthened from the inner resources of spiritual insight can supply a strength of purpose capable of withstanding the pressures of a materialistic way of life. In ancient times, the problem was therefore to build an instrument within man himself by which he could become aware of the cause of himself. Now many have held that uh, this is only a kind of egotism that the mystics were trying only to save themselves, but this is not true any more than it is fair to say that the average scientist or educator is primarily concerned with saving himself. The actual reason for the mystic was not that he might become nobler than somebody else. It was that he might help to perfect a structure which would be capable of leading humanity into a new relationship with reality. He was not working for himself, but working for the common good. But as all arts and sciences have had inventors, those who began the labor, and then this beginning was passed to others, so the mystics have had their inventors, have had their sources, and they honor these sources as a scientist honors a great name in science. But this does not mean that these sources were motivated by self-interest, unless you spell the self with a capital S, for they represent the individual trying to fulfill the purpose for which he was intended, namely that he might become a an enlightened and complete being of service to the universe and to his fellow creature. The search for these realities called immediately upon the person. And if we study and analyze all kinds of people in all kinds of places, we come to the realization inevitably that capacities differ, that specializations and aptitudes differ. But one thing the mystics found in the beginning, and which I think has never been disproved, is that there is a potential in each human being that is greater than the use he has made of that potential up to the present time. In other words, he is better than he knows himself to be. He has more value than he realizes. He has more possibilities than he has ever sensed or experienced. Now, of course, when you start telling him this, you may find he becomes a rather arrogant character. He begins, he begins to be too proud of himself, and becoming very aware of his own potential, he struts about with it, but does nothing to develop it. This means that he has mistaken the basic idea. He has failed to recognize that a potential in order to be changed into a potency, must go through some form of specialized training. This is no way different from any other branch of learning. Your scientist is a man of trained mind. He is a graduate of some institute that specialized in the things that concern him. He has spent many, many years learning to understand the field of his own specialization. During this time, he very likely has largely neglected to develop the field of his own character. 
he has become immersed in a subject. And this subject has taken over. And in this subject, he is a dedicated person. But at the same time, his own private affairs may go to pieces. In the same general thinking, then, there is no reason why we should assume that a philosopher does not require training, or that a mystic does not require discipline. We have every reason to assume that in order to attain the highest phase of genius in any area, it is necessary to release potential. And that uh, type of mind or emotion or soul that has released the most of its own potential is the one that advances most rapidly in its chosen pursuits. So the uh, mystics tried to find a way they postulated an upper hemisphere that be rose above the pinnacles of matter. That the, uh, the material hemisphere was the lower, the spiritual hemisphere was the higher. And that this spiritual hemisphere was just as rich in mysteries, just as rich in natural resources, just as abundant in all values as the material world, and in many ways completely transcended matter. Because in some manner or way, all life comes from this upper hemisphere. Souls and spirits fall as a gentle dew from heaven. Everything comes from the above, descends into the below, lingers for a time and then returns to the above from which it came. This cycle has been recognized always, but trying to make it into something practical and useful has been the great question. Theology, it seems to me, also has one valid point, which perhaps gives justification for its sense of importance. Whatever be the nature of life, unless the individual at death ceases utterly, forever, that which survives death must have an existence apart from matter. And if we are to consider the phenomena of life around us, it would seem that a considerable part of the life of every living thing is lived outside of body. If we believe in reincarnation, we realize the interval between lives, the individual exists, but he is not embodied as we know it. If there is survival of consciousness, and there is some universal heaven toward which all things proceed, then survival in that heaven will be infinitely longer than survival here on earth. If the individual survives, he should devote some attention to his, his condition outside of body. His existence in body is brief, and it becomes more hazardous every day. Therefore, to give oneself entirely to a way of life which must inevitably end is, it seems, short-sighted. If we could guarantee that there was no life beyond this, then the individual might be forgiven for living as highly as he can while he's here. But this is not demonstrable. We have no proof of this, whatever. And if the scientist, scientific materialist insists that we have no afterlife, he can no more prove it then the theologian can physically prove the existence of an afterlife. Both of these points of view are hypothetical. And of these two hypotheses, which is the most useful? Is it better to believe or not to believe? Is a cynic or a skeptic a better person? Is the world a better person for unbelieving? There seems grave doubt as to this. It would appear from the whole record of history that the belief 
in the survival of life after death is one of the most important concepts of which the human mind is capable and has brought more security, hope, and discipline to human thinking than any other form of belief. So the most useful belief is the reality of a spiritual existence. This is perhaps well demonstrated in the constant struggle today to keep religion alive and the fact that it is gaining rapidly religion increasing in importance as physical securities diminish. If this is a rule, then when the physical securities of a human life diminish and at the end of this mortal existence these securities have diminished completely, then the individual is dependent upon his internal values to sustain him uh, beyond the physical structure of mortality. So the practical thing, which perhaps is more important than a scientific thing, we think always of science as practical. But actually, we have little proof of it because science has contributed so many disasters that we might doubt how practical it really is. The most practical thing or belief is that by which we most advance the dignity of the human race, by which we most advance the great causes of civilization and principles and purposes, love of beauty, friendship, peace, understanding, these are the great values, and these values arise not from material science, but rather from the inner life of the person. They arise in those who have accepted the reality of a divine plan. It has always been a question as to how some of these various teachings have been disseminated. What proof have we that the prophets spoke truly? What proof have we that the Lord was with Moses? What proof have we that the sacred books of the world were written under some form of divine inspiration or guidance? And what proof have we or can we bestow upon the modern mystic who, living according to his inner convictions, has experiences which others do not have. How can he prove these experiences to those who have not had them? The simple answer is he can't. And the same is true of practically all religious phenomena. Religion is a highly personal thing. It can convert only the individual who accepts it. It can bring a religious consolation only to those who believe it. And this consolation cannot be transmitted to another person, especially in terms of the higher mystical issue. And yet religion has also in it something that is exceedingly commonplace. It has a simple code of relationships. It has simple points of emphasis which can be communicated. and by which education can be amplified. But beyond the possibility of the individual transmitting the ethics and integrities of religion, all he can do is pass on something that the receiver can accept or reject according to his own conviction. There is no way that he can confer an inner experience upon another person. Thus we have the rise of a religious mysticism. And the religious mysticism scattered itself all over the world, uh, making many sects, groups, and uh, religious 
systems. But the only way in which it was possible uh, for the individual to advance religiously was through a series of conduct changes within himself. Science works with the mind <coughs> primarily. Religion works with the heart and its acts. That which it does and that which it experiences within itself. Therefore, in religion, the emphasis is upon soul growth or soul unfoldment or soul release from bondage to skepticism, ignorance, and misinterpretation. To accomplish this, it was necessary for the individual, as we find in the New Testament, the individual to transform himself. He must change himself from a mechanistic structure of muscles and bones until he sees himself as a living temple, that his real existence is not physical, but is in the spirit. If he can achieve this in himself, then he is ready for what might be termed a scientific approach to religion. Religion also has its science, which is generally more or less overlooked. The unfoldment of the consciousness of the being the unfoldment of its internal resources towards ultimate, ultimate personal experience of God. These, these unfoldments are according to law. The same universal law that keeps the planets in their orbits also tells the way in which growth is intended to go. That the individual who would know the doctrine must live the life. He must make those adjustments in his own character by means of which he is capable of releasing the inner potential of his own soul power. This was a disciplined procedure. The ancients divided this discipline into two parts, the first of which they called a cathartic discipline inasmuch as the first part was always purification. The individual must gradually purify his life of such attitudes and conduct patterns as are detrimental to his own good. Discipline in form of purification has never required that which was not obviously useful. In other words, it does not require that an individual uh, shall change away from the practical to the theoretical. The pri primary disciplines of philosophy are really the disciplines of intelligent living. They are the way that we should all live. And the mystical disciplines are merely a gradual amplification of this procedure. For example, the first discipline of the ancients was purification. The simplest form of purification uh, was taking a bath. It was a purely physical action, but it was a means of keeping the body clean. The next form of purification is to keep the emotions clean. Another form of purification is to keep the mind clean. Another form of discipline was the discipline of moderation, by means of which the body, being moderate in all matters, has the greatest chance of survival. The emotions, being moderate, also had the greatest possibility of maturing and developing without conflict. And moderation mentally means that the individual shall avoid those extremes by which his own life are in danger, or his own life is in danger. Another form of discipline is nutrition. Not to take into the body that which is useless and detrimental to it. Not to take into the emotions things that are useless and detrimental. Not to take into the mind 
ideas that are false and destructive. Therefore, right nutrition is that the mind shall have the proper things to think about, the emotions, the proper objectives for its na their natural feelings, and the body, the proper sustenance in food. There is also another discipline of exercise. The body is exercised in order to keep its muscle tone. The emotions are expressed creatively. Art, music, these are the exercises of the emotions by means of which they are kept healthy. On the, men on the mental level, exercise is thoughtfulness. The dedication of the mind to constructive purposes, the gradual purification of those attitudes which might cause the corruption of the individual. So the, the original disciplines of religion are nothing different from what it, they should be practiced by everyone. And there is no real reason why any scientist should object to it, because they would only make his own world more useful in his own life, more likely to extend itself to the maximum number of years. After the disciplines of purification have were properly understood and applied, and the intemperances of the body were modified, so that there would be no longer uh, any interference on the part of the lower nature, so to call it, uh, with the progresses and purposes of the higher nature. Then, in peace of mind, gentleness of heart, and complete relaxation of body, the individual is ready to go into the more advanced discipline until he is able to attain internal equilibrium, he cannot achieve the greater good. As it says in the Zohar, unbalanced forces perish in the void. Thus pass the giants of ancient times. Unbalanced living destroys itself. Unbalanced prejudices destroy themselves. So the discipline is a very simple and natural thing. The next uh, phase of the matter was usually involved in the mysteries of symbolism. Once this nature had been normalized and was able to think apart from prejudices and deceits, it could contemplate the natural realities of life. The supreme symbol which is given to man for the edification of himself and the perfection of his own nature is creation itself. The world, with all its mysterious involvements, all of this vast pageantry is one great symbol, a mandala. And this symbol bears witness to the infinite wisdom of an infinite plan. So the meditating person contemplating this mystery begins to ask himself why things are as they are. And he begins to explore a little bit into the phenomena of life. He begins to see behind the surface of existence the causal purposes of existence. He becomes aware that creation is the fulfillment of laws, and the recreation of himself is a fulfillment of laws. As Paracelsus said, those who would understand the wisdom of heaven must walk the pages of the book with his own feet. Through experience, we gain gradually increasing respect for truth. But if this experience comes before discipline or before catharsis, before the uh, disciplines of purification, the interpretations will be wrong. While the individual can interpret natural phenomena in terms of his own personal interests, he will never find the truth. If he uses all his knowledge to find ways of exploiting his own career, he will never find truth. 
to find the meaning of the symbol, the true meaning, in the universe. He must be without prejudice and without pressure. And this means that he must have quietly overcome the inconstancies and inconsistencies of his own nature. Out of this idea of a symbolical approach uh, comes the individual exploring the commonplace, looking behind the simple surfaces of things to find what makes them work, to find what makes them do the things they were supposed to do. Gradually from this contemplation there comes a new kind of factuality, which is reality, in which the person, gradually moving through his own unfolding understanding of the divine purpose of things, reaches a state of admiration, of wonder, of devotion, until it seems that he can give all of himself without reservation to the magnificent reality which is hidden behind the commonplace. That he is actually able in this way to completely convert himself to the reality of deity. That he is no longer a thought, no longer a symbol. He is no longer a member of something because he has been baptized. He is a member of something free and in the spirit, simply because the investigation of the commonplace has revealed to him, as Lord Bacon puts it, that no miracles are necessary. The commonplace is itself sufficiently miraculous. This brings us slowly into a focal point, which is actually religion. Religion is the individual beginning with a single step, faith, and continuing until he justifies his own faith by the continual growth of himself. And when he has achieved this, there is no longer any doubt or uncertainty in his nature. And he also, in the course of this growth, discovers his common responsibility for service with all others and all creatures that exist in the world. It is a motion from diversity to unity, to borrow the Pythagorean theory, in which the individual gradually comes to know that the universe is one, a complete unit, and that diversities of all kinds are merely expressions within that one, and the unity itself of reality can never be divided. In the same general way now, we go down uh, to the scientific level. Are we dealing with anything essentially different? We are dealing with the surface, theology with the depth. But the surface itself is just as much a part of the book of life as the depth. The scientist has every possible inducement uh, to solve the questions that he asks himself. He has, however, tried to build the answers to these questions, not from the personal experience of growth, but by combining the testimonies of other workers in the same fields. He takes the attitude, for instance, that if five very distinguished uh, scientists agree on this point, that point is true. He has not proved it for himself. He has assumed it, he would like to prove it, and perhaps his own experiences and experiments support, at least in part, the point of view which he wishes and will accept. But he has not experienced it. He has not gone beyond uh, the pattern of his own intellectualism. He cannot, and has not as yet at least, uh, been able to find the silence in himself so that his final hypothesis becomes in turn a symbol. He has not reached the point in which he understands that every scientific principle he is working with, every discovery he makes in any field of energy, time, or space is merely a symbol of an eternal principle. 
and that this eternal principle, though diversified through time and space, is ever and always has been the substance which we call God. If the scientist goes further, far enough, he's going to inevitably come to that point in his own researches when he realizes that the universe is a magnificent, intelligent structure enlivened by a divine power. He is going to find it necessary to understand this in order to answer the final questions that will arise in his own mind. So today, science is not irreconcilable with religion. And in the life of the average person, there are certain things that I think we can all work with. We can look for the symbolisms in science, and we can look for the symbolisms in religion. We work every day with commonplace things that science has given us. These things can stimulate in us a specialized sense of values. We can discriminate in the use of scientific knowledge. For example, a commonplace instance that we all recognize today. Science has given us the television set, but it has not discriminated. It has not told us how to use it, and it will not tell us how to use it, because by this time it has been so involved in a commercial situation uh, that any major change would seem detrimental to the survival of the industry. Yet the individual can do exactly as his own consciousness dictates. He can use it as the basis of self-discipline. He can use it as a means of releasing his own sense of values. He can do it, he can use it in order to determine that which is suitable to him and that which is not suitable. And every program, every evening, is an experience from which a certain profit can be taken, or it is an experience which is a total waste of time, or worse. But everything that we know, our utilities, our automobiles, all of our scientific discoveries, all our discoveries in drugs and things of this kind, all demand something that science can't bestow, and that's discriminating use. That discriminating use rests with the individual. And the highest form of discriminating use is observed in those who are religiously oriented. It is very seldom that a materialist will have the same discrimination in determining what is good for himself or his family or his world. Therefore, out of the scientific progress, we can all read a little. We can observe with some thoughtfulness opinions concerning space travel. We can consider with thought as all of the modern devices that are being developed. We can also read with a certain amount of anxiety uh, the troubled story of the abuses of knowledge. Uh, we can learn the waste of values, how in the name of profit science is being used to support extravagances and to maintain vanities. These things science disclaims responsibility for. It says we invented it, people will use it as they please. This is probably a mistaken idea, but it is an escape for the individual who does not wish to face his own conscience. But even if he is uh, unable to discipline his own discoveries, Every person who makes use of his inventiveness can discipline his own use. He can gradually spiritualize his attitudes toward these things which he has regarded as indispensable. He will discover the billions he is wasting on vanity. He will recognize the importance of moderate living, of economy, he will begin again, perhaps, to develop a certain sense of economic honesty 
in which he will not hazard his own future by unnecessary spending. Everything that we, we have can be abused. Ignorance will abuse it. Wisdom will use it well. It's all in the use factor. So science can give us things, and religion can help us, uh, to administer so-called progress, that it will never lose its integrities. One thing that we have to realize, and thus we do more and more, is that no one can take away from us the right or the means of personal decision. The only way in which we can get into trouble is to accept temptation and be over-influenced by it. If we decide that we are going to live on a certain level of consciousness, we can. And nothing that is done around us can actually prevent us from doing this. It may be difficult, and it has been well reported that the better we live, the more difficult living becomes. But it really isn't quite that way. It looks that way from the outside. But the individual whose life has been new complications because of his integrities also has new integrities with which to defend himself against his temptations. And uh, a right deed is no longer difficult if there is no temptation to commit an evil one. So actually, it looks from the outside sometimes that people trying to live well destroy their own advantages. But actually, if they live well, they have gained advantages in terms of value, in terms of realities that far exceed anything that they could have lost. So we have now people who are working with religion. They are working with religion uh, and are seeking to find a true faith. Max Miller, the great German Orientalist, said there was never a false religion unless a child is a false man. Some religions are simpler than others, some more complicated. But in all, integrities are um, approximately identical. And these integrities are the basis of religion, and they constitute the science of religion. For religion is a science by which man grows into the fullness of his own potential. And this is just exactly as important as the individual having larger and more expensive houses, auto automobiles, or other luxuries. Science can give him a better physical environment, but only religion can make him a better person to live in that environment and live in it wisely. And religion also provides the consolation so that if that environment for one reason or another is taken away, the individual is not damaged. He is not damaged because he was never enslaved to his own environment or his own possessions. Today religion is making, I think, some mistake in trying to term itself completely in the terms of science trying to make religion sound scientific on a material level and trying to create a system of terms or sects or something of this nature that will be acceptable to science. This, I am afraid, is a lost cause for the reason that no non-scientist can possibly have the knowledge of science which will enable him to discomfort a trained scientist. He cannot do it. His only answer is to admit that we have two different institutions and that these two institutions can be compatible, uh, but one cannot be forced upon the other, nor can one be interpreted in the terms of the other. In the same way, science is trying to um, arbitrate some of its differences with religion. The scientific arbitration for the most part, takes the form of ignoring. It's just not discussed. Uh, but there is no violent opposition, except in a few activistic groups. The uh, scientist is perfectly willing to let religion live. He doesn't entirely approve of it, 
He thinks people are duping themselves with it, but if they want to do that, uh, they can. Now, if the scientist wants to know whether or not he is sure of what he believes, you have another problem on your hands. You have the same problem on your hands that was, that was brought to my attention once when I was traveling in India. Namely, uh, are these Indian disciplines uh, correct? Uh, are they forms of auto-hypnosis? The scientist is inclined to disparage them. That form of science, which we call psychology, is beginning to mitigate, uh, to mediate between these things, and trying to accept what seems to be useful, such as acupuncture, which it cannot explain completely. But in this particular case, the Oriental told me, he said, send your scientists to us. Let them live with us for five years. Then ask them what they believe. But to leave them on the opposite side of the world condemning us is unscientific. <laughs> and the point was well taken. If a scientist wants to weigh whether or not religion is valid, there's only one way he can do it. And that is fulfill the laws and rules relating to religion. If he wishes to make an experiment in his laboratory, he has to follow rules or the experiment won't work. If he wishes to experiment with life, he must live the rules of life or the experiment will not succeed. Therefore, let him, before he decides, take upon himself the programs of practical religious living. Not that he has to join some sect or creed, but that he takes those essential spiritual values which have been disseminated throughout the whole world and apply them to his own conduct. Let him do his own purification. Let him purify the body, the emotions, and the mind. Let him rise above the temptations of avarice. Let him live in harmony with his own integrity. Let him do what he knows he ought to do, and perhaps what he learned to do at his mother's knee before he ever went to school. Let him be unselfish. Let him be dedicated. Let him be sure that his discoveries and inventions will be a practical service and let him work out a compassion for human need rather than for income and profit. Let him do this for five years. Then let him decide whether religion is valid or not. If he will do these things, I am sure that he will find that the improvements of his character greatly outweigh what might be called uh, his scientific uh, prejudices. He will discover himself as a living person. He will recognize more and more his kinship with life. He will find that the tendency to neglect or disrupt, disrupt families will be less. He will have closer relationship with his children. He will have greater sympathy for the suffering of mankind and will be less willing to contribute to that suffering by advancing programs of armament. He will find that the mellowing of his own nature brings with it benefits far greater than his prejudices could ever confer upon him. Then let him decide whether he is going to be a religious person or not. Many folks do not have to make this decision today. The number of those who have quietly, internally, and naturally dedicated themselves to idealism is increasing every hour. To those to whom religion already is real, who no longer have to fight to believe it, who are no longer willing to be materialistic, an acceptance is the first step, but it must not end there. The individual who says, I believe, immediately takes upon himself the, the responsibility to be what he believes. And this is where 
popular religion has had a tendency to fail. I know too many people who are nominally religious, but it has produced practically no change in their dispositions. They still have the same antagonisms and animosities, the same prejudices and the same intolerance. Nothing has been changed except a label. They have listed themselves among the redeemed, but show very small indication of redemption. On this basis, the membership is always going to be nominal, and the effect of religion upon the life of that individual is going to be very marginal at best. Yet a stranger looking on and seeing a world, world that calls itself religious, keeping right on with the practices that help the heathens would reject, asks themselves and asks others just exactly what religion does do. And uh, this explains a lot of disillusionment in this area. Unless religion produces a marked effect upon life, it is no better than materialism. So on the basis of this, the committed person who really wants to try to do something must immediately go under those disciplines which we've already referred to. They must immediately begin the process of cleaning the inside of the cup. They must fight against the weaknesses and the abilities of their own attitudes. And it is only when they overcome a weakness or correct a fault that they may be said to make a step in the right direction. So if we are more or less dedicated and want to be more so, the only thing to realize for the moment is that if the dedication is supported by conduct, the spiritual resource available to the individual will be correspondingly increased. And what might be very difficult for a person who has had no development of spiritual resource becomes comparatively easy after this resource has been established. In other words, as you correct a mistake, the internal integrity in yourself grows stronger, and you become more and more capable of correcting larger mistakes or of practically reintegrating your entire personality. As you grow through conduct, your resource in spiritual advancement is strengthened. And the main thing then that you have to be careful of is that this search for truth does not become too self-centered. There are too many people who are seeking for a spiritual insight in order that in some mysterious way uh, they can profit by it in terms of advantage or social adjustment or something of this nature. All this religion is not for gain but for giving. The individual should grow only for one basic emotion, that he shall be a better pen in the hand of a ready writer. He should work always in order to prepare himself to be an instrument of the divine purpose. If he forgets himself or loses his life in the sake of truth, then he shall have life everlasting. Thus, each person who relinquishes selfness becomes, in a sense, nearer to immortality. For immortality is selflessness. And its greatest value to the average person is that it gives to the person the clear insight that it is not for self-advancement that we grow. We grow because it is part of the plan that every living thing shall unfold its resources for the common good of all that lives. And the service of self must give way to the service of all that lives. This is a more or less advanced step, but it is the final decision that must be made. And those who make that rightly come very close to reality. Those who are unable to take that step find themselves still in the shadow of materiality. The materiality is not merely a scientific materialism, 
It is wherever self-interest dominates the individual. And self-interest is really the destroyer of the divine interest which we are all seeking to gain and cultivate through our activities and labors. So we can learn something from science. Science can help us to discipline and order and proceed according to a pattern. To stay with the truths as we understand them. To grow with the insight that in, unfolds within ourselves. And with each step, recognize our increasing responsibility to the living universe of which we are a part. These things can be made relatively scientific. The scientist, on the other hand, can certainly find through self-discipline and through the quietude and through the reintegration of his own life further and further inducement to recognize the divine principle of the source of life. The disciplines will help the scientists to find God through natural law, through the divine plan of things, through the ever unfolding mystery of existence. And the religious person will finally come into a compatibility with science. He will realize that science is a name for something that is spiritual, but we don't know that. Science is nothing but the vindication of the infinite wisdom and skill which governs existence. Science is the first recognition that all things are law and order, that all things have their proper times and their seasons, that the universe is a constant unfolding mystery of eternal life. And as the scientist comes more and more to that point of view, he comes closer and closer to theology. And as the uh, religious person uh, comes closer to the realization of the constant meaning, the religious person is not looking through natural laws for these things. He is looking through human conduct. He is looking for the inspirations that come in the everyday circumstances of life. The scientist discovers realities, so-called, or facts, with telescopes uh, or other instruments, and the mystic finds the same mystery unfolded through the eyes of little children and through the commonplace things of life, so that every ordinary occurrence becomes an evidence or manifestation of a divine purpose. To do simple things beautifully is just as scientific as to measure space. And to discover through the things we do the values we need for living is to come in the end to the highest form of education. Well, thank you very much, folks. I'd like to mention at this time, perhaps, that our trustee, Dr. Marcus Bach, will be here next Sunday morning. Many of you know about his work and the very beautiful photographic and artistic work of his wife. And I'm sure you will be interested in the message that Dr. Bach has. He will be with you next Sunday morning. Thank you very much.